Wow, good morning. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope you have coffee or tea or something to wake you up this morning. We have a pretty globally distributed uh, panel today. So that's really exciting. I'm going to go ahead and just kick it off. Um, we have a few more attendees just trickling in at the moment, but I want to get this started right on time. So welcome, everybody. This is our third installment of Oyster Hour. Um, the future of remote work has been a topic that is just hot, hot, hot the past couple of months and I think is really just the light at the end of this tunnel of all of this COVID and working from home stress and isolation and now people are starting to realize, hey, there's some things here that are actually working for us and this is really great and as companies think towards the future and realize that they need talent and can begin hiring again, what better way to use the lessons that we've learned during this time than to look outwardly for amazing talent worldwide. And so Regina and Erica, thank you so much for joining me today. In a few seconds, I'm going to have you introduce yourselves, but I'm super excited to talk about uh, the remote hiring process. So far for all of our attendees, if you've missed installments one and two, we focus so far on how to really create that job remotely. What does the job spec look like? What legal considerations to take into account? Uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, we discussed really how to recruit and find that amazing talent worldwide. And now we'll sum it up today by talking about that interview process and how to actually make that hiring decision. Um, so I'm going to jump right into that. Um, welcome again. Some just basic housekeeping I mentioned to some of the early birds that joins the call. We panelists can see each other and so hopefully we're going to have a really engaging conversation for all of you. We unfortunately can't see you wherever you're joining in from. So first and foremost, I'd love for all of our attendees to introduce themselves in the chat box. Uh, let us know where you're dialing in from um, and what your smoothie of choice for this Oyster Hour today. And throughout the webinar, we really do want to hear from you and make it as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A functionality or the chat box again to make sure that we can add those into today's conversation. Um, and so to kick us off, um, I'm Allie Green here today representing Oyster. Oyster is an amazing company who enables other remote companies to employ great talent wherever they're located. And I think it's super awesome that today I can announce that uh, they have announced general availability of their platform in 50 countries, which covers 90% of the knowledge worker population. So it's a really exciting day for Oyster and not just because of this webinar, which I'm really excited for. Um, and so I want to just kick this off by letting everybody get to know our guests a little bit. So, Radino, why don't you share a little bit more about who you are, what Vox Advisory does, and really why are you passionate about remote work or if you have any funny or memorable work from home memories that have happened over the past couple of months. Thanks so much, Tali. Really appreciate the invite. I've been actually following Oyster for some time, so I was delighted to be part of this uh, really nice panel with Erica. Now, as you can tell by my name, I'm not Irish, but I am based in Ireland, okay? Uh, I'm originally from Bulgaria, okay? Small country in Eastern Europe, in the Balkans. Um, don't try to pronounce my surname, okay? My first name is enough, Radina. Um, I've been in the talent acquisition world for around 12 years in different types of roles, in-house, executive consultant, etc. But nearly two years ago, I decided to jump off the corporate ship and I set a Vox advisory. And um, I guess I see myself um, in the intersection between the talent, so everyone out there that is exploring or passively exploring or just looking for their career options and the organizations, whether it's startups, scale-ups, larger structures, I feel that um, the best role for me uh, right now is to be a, a lecturer, advisor, and a trainer. So, I don't identify as a recruiter anymore, but um, I am very heavily embedded in the talent acquisition world. So I try to advise startups on having the best strategy. Why remote? I've been, well, I'm an expat first and foremost. Let's start with there. Um, as an expat, uh, my family, my friends are somewhere else, right? 
uh, probably the only reason why I keep social media is because I am stalking at my, my friends and family, what they're doing. But um, for me, remote was uh, digital nomadism five years ago. Now I'm in my 30s. My priorities have changed a lot. So it's uh, flexibility and work-life balance. And I feel remote can give that to the right people. It's not for everyone, but I think it, it can definitely work for me. Uh, a funny story, actually, it's from this summer. So it's very, very fresh. I was back home in Bulgaria for a month. Despite the craziness, I really wanted to spend a bit of time with my family after I self-isolated, okay? No one should, uh, should uh, question that. Um, and I had to do a client training from my grandma's apartment. Now, if you've never been to Eastern Europe, typical grandma's apartment is photos of all the kids and all the family members everywhere, super old school wardrobes everywhere. So I literally had to put bed sheets, colorful bed sheets on top of the wardrobes um, and try to put massive amount of boxes so that I am standing in order for the client not to see what's happening behind me and where I'm actually at. Um, so I managed to convince them that it's a professional setup. But yeah, I, I, I'd say I would avoid my grandma's apartment from now on. Um, so guess, yeah, that's in a nutshell about me. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I think... Um, Taking into consideration what background you're using is another hot topic lately. And I think it's really fascinating how you can either let people in and show your whole self right from the get go, creating that trust or the scenarios where you um, might be self-conscious about those family photos behind you and how you handle that. And I'd love to dig into a concept that seems as simple as what the backdrop is behind you, but how it could impact maybe how candidates are being evaluated on re remote and virtual calls. So we'll get to that soon. Um, Erica from LA, thank you for waking up uh, and, and getting started with joining us this morning. I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and also to share with the audience a little bit more about what Zapier does. Yeah, yeah. First off, it's Zapier. Zapier makes Zapier. Me happier. That's how I. Now I will it. always remember. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm Erica. I'm in Los Angeles. Um, I have been in recruiting for about 10, 11 years now. Um, I do, at my heart, consider myself a recruiter. Though today I manage a team. <laughs> I am a manager of talent acquisition at Zapier. Uh, Zapier is a fully remote company. We've been remote since the very beginning, since 2012. Uh, and so we've really grown kind of an interesting remote culture. Um, speaking on just that kind of funny story, we're all in COVID times and everyone's work-life situations have changed. Um, I used to work down the hall. Uh, my room is no longer, or my office is no longer mine. So I'm in my bedroom today. Um, but, you know, my husband, our, our bathroom is right there. Our closet is right there. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I was on a one-on-one -on -one and Aaron did not realize that I was uh, on a meeting and <laughs> started disrobing right off the screen. Um, I really quickly got, um, to put, went to video off and it was like very, it was just like this tiny little bit, but it was such a funny moment for me and the person I was in the one-on-one -on -one with just because we're all living this reality. We're all, you know, we, we are all experiencing this together. And so, it's a little bit different. It depends on like the situation that we're in. Like Radina, when I'm talking to a, uh, a candidate or I'm talking to, you know, uh, perhaps an executive, I might change the way I am operating in terms of like what's in my background versus, um, you know, if I'm working with a teammate and we're, you know, having, we're sipping our coffee and I'm sitting in my kitchen and there's stuff going on in the background. Like there's a little bit more like um, comfort there to show, to show what's going on and, and letting people into my home. But back to Zapier. Um, so uh, Zapier is a workflow automation platform. Um, we have over 2,000 apps that sit on top of our platform. So oh, almost any app that you can think of that you're utilizing at work, um, you can connect. If you're moving information between them, 
So say you have an attachment in your Gmail and every single time you have an attachment that is titled a certain thing, you want it to go into your Dropbox in a certain folder. Um, you could set up what we call zaps um, to automatically move that information as soon as it comes into your email over to your Dropbox. Um, automatically, you don't have to touch it. So you just set up your workflow and it works. That's what we do. Um, we have millions of customers and, um, and we are adding new apps onto our platform every day. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. And I just love the stories of like during these times, how are people coming together? How are people really using things like humor and vulnerability to show the situation that they're in? And despite it all that people are still getting their work done and still being successful. And I just think that's really cool. I think back to some of the odd places that I have both interviewed candidates on video uh, as well as talked to team members um, with things that you're allowed to be a little bit more, um, I think, kooky or crazy <laughs> with your with your uh, places of video calls. And I think the most impressive setup I ever had was I turned my bicycle into an office station so that I could do a team meeting outside. Um, have not ever interviewed someone uh, in a place like that, but I also am in the south of Spain. So I think the most jealous worthy backgrounds that I've ever interviewed a candidate was with the sea behind me um, at, at a cafe. Uh, so, so I've definitely had those, um, those different backgrounds and sort of FOMO of where people is working as well. So I think it's something now that really is bringing people together even though they're apart. Um, which, which is really cool. But I think the one thing that's less cool or at least less comfortable for people is, yes, we are bonding over video calls. We're making it work. We're able to talk to candidates. But it is really hard still using things like virtual communication to really allow candidates a chance to fully see the job that they're applying for. Something that I had talked about on the last webinar, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out, it's on YouTube, um, go find it, uh, is this idea of if you're in real life and there's an office to go to, as a candidate, you can really see if people are smiling or frowning, if people are interacting with each other over coffee in the communal spaces, and you get a sense of what the company is all about. We talked a lot about how that brand awareness from an employee standpoint really can trickle into the interview process. But it does make things like this a lot harder for candidates to really evaluate if they're a good fit for the role, if they're going to be excited about the role. And vice versa, it's a learning process for managers to really learn how to get comfortable, how to make the candidate comfortable so that they can show off their talents during the interview process. And I see everybody sort of nodding their heads. Radina, when, when we were talking about getting this speaker series started, I really just loved your mission where you said that you wanted to repair the bridge between organizations on both sides. And so to, to kick it off, I have a question for you. Um, I'd love to know like where you have seen this gap um, and maybe like, what do you feel are one or two of the biggest pieces of frustration between the candidate and the company? And how can companies help close those gaps? Thanks a lot for the question. And um, I was actually thinking a lot about the on-site versus online experience because when I was at Airbnb, this was actually a great selling point. Hey, let's give you a tour of the office because it's Airbnb, right? It's very colorful and very uh, funky. So that was a selling point. Um, to go back to your question, when it comes to the, the challenges and what, is, what are the gaps, the big thing, and I think it's across the board, regardless of which country we're talking about, which industry, and it's not only in tech, it's everywhere expectations versus reality. I don't know if you've seen, you probably have seen these memes everywhere, you know, what, what I think I'm doing, what the society thinks I'm doing and what actually I'm doing. Um, and as funny as that sounds, it's actually pretty tragic because employers have this kind of ideal purple unicorn type of scenario where they're going to find this amazing candidate that fits all the boxes. And that's why we see job descriptions and job ads that are super long, incredibly detailed. They're very much 
this is what you you're supposed to bring here and then there is a short paragraph about oh yeah we're really cool right um and then on the flip side there are the candidates who are quite unsure especially in the times we live in right now quite unsure what is a good match there is such a crazy title taxonomy from one company to another and especially the remote organizations are the new kit on the block right they're so appealing they're very interesting they are perceived and and i'm sure erica will confirm i'm sure you're inundated by am amounts of candidates from all over the globe and it becomes incredibly difficult um, so the candidates are puzzled by okay what should i look for what's the right place the companies are puzzled by well we want an ideal candidate when this person doesn't exist right so what my mission is yes indeed to ensure that the employers have a better more realistic idea of what's happening um, and then the candidates to be a bit more confident and to feel a bit more in control because traditionally the recruitment process is perceived as me as the recruiter or the company i'm in a position of power and then the candidate is the one that i'm interviewing i don't think that's anymore the case and i I've, I've seen remote companies completely shifting that around so i'm very excited about this change yeah, it's interesting. On the one hand, companies have access to so much more talent by being remote. But with all of this growth of remote companies, the individual and the candidates now have that choice as well. So how would you recommend um, on the candidate side for them to build that confidence? How, what's the first step in like trying to be successful in, in that hiring process? I know it might sound ridiculous, but I'm a psychologist, okay? I do believe in psychometric tests. I do believe in the Maslow hierarchy of needs. I do feel that the first step is really building your self-awareness. There are a few exercises where you can figure out, okay, what are my soft skills? What are the skills for success? And also, what are the skills of the future? What are the remote companies really looking for? And I'm trying to escape from this stigma around, oh, culture fit. That's something that is out there. It's again like a purple unicorn. We don't know what that is. Candidates don't understand that. So my biggest advice is to start with um, building up your self-awareness around what are your skills, okay? What are the areas that you're still not really aware of? And figure out what are the skills for the future. Things like cultural awareness. Who is teaching that? I don't think many people are. Curiosity. This is a skill that we used to have when we were kids, right? But in a, in a remote setup, you need to be curious. You need to be incredibly proactive. If you sit and wait for instructions, you get lost. And um, so being um, coachable, being self-starter. So for me, it always starts with figure out what are the right skills, what these companies are looking for. Not the ideal position. It's all about skill set. Yeah, and I think that's really great advice for companies and hiring managers too, to think about what are the skills that need to get done, the basic minimum requirements for the job, and then like how can you test for things like curiosity and what things are you willing to coach on? And Erica, what I think is really cool about Zapier, just thinking about that like laundry list that normal job applications will have and how they will look at a resume and just start like ticking it off against the requirements. And I know Zapier has totally thrown that old outdated model away and focuses on applications instead of resumes. And many people might think that being remote, you would need to get all the information possible on the candidate. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case in this scenario. So I'd love for you to share more information behind why this decision was made and also what does it look like in practice? Yeah, so it's funny because we today we actually have, we have a space where you can submit a resume or a LinkedIn profile as optional, but the core of our decision that we make is based on applications. Um, it was made actually before my time. I've been in Zapier for two and a half years, but it was made way back when um, for a couple of different reasons. I mean, the biggest reason that is because our main form of communication at Zapier is writing. We write like 90% of the way that we communicate because we are we work asynchronously. It's mostly in Slack. Um, we're writing 
lots of like deep dives and product information and, and logs just to like track all the things that we're doing as a company. Um, and so having a written application um, where we're asking a, an applicant to communicate uh, something specific <laughs> is a really great way of helping us judge. Can, can they communicate? Can they be succinct? Can they get to their point? Can they answer a question directly? Can they get the information to you that, that they should be sharing and that they want to share? Um, so that's kind of like the, the biggest thing. Um, each of our applications are designed specifically for the job that we're hiring for. Um, so, you know, an applicant, when they come to Zapier and they're taking a look at a senior marketing manager role, um, they can tell the skills that we're looking for based on the questions that we're asking. Um, and I'm, I hope, and I've heard from candidates that it gives them a better idea of the expectations of the role. This is stuff that you will actually do in the job. Um, and then can you speak to, have you done it before? Um, could you do it before? Have, do you have similarly related experience that could directly relate to this thing that we're asking of you? Um, and then the third thing that really kind of helps is it helps us as recruiters get a little bit more creative around um, uh, different types of backgrounds. Um, when you look at a resume, I feel like it, um, it really trains you to look for certain things. Similar industry you know, certain schools, like there's like a formula. And as a recruiter, I know you've seen like resumes, you get six seconds. I don't know where that number ever came from, but apparently it's six seconds mm -hmm. <laughs> to look at a resume. Um, and if you take that out of the equation and you're just looking at like, these are the skills for the job, can you do them? Do you have these skills? Have you had the experience to apply these, these skills? Um, it helps us uh, take away some of that, um, just those expectations around what a candidate should have done in their background to be able to be um, uh, qualified for the role. But that's, that's really where that came from. Um, it's been successful for us so far. Um, and the recruiters on the team, it can be challenging at times because we do get a lot of applications, but we really do love reading them because we get to learn so much more about our candidates so that when we jump on a recruiter screen, we've already got such a solid basis of like who this person is. So then we can dive deeper when we actually get on calls with them. Yeah. That's awesome. Besides, um, besides written communication and the ability for someone to be able to navigate what information is going to be the most valuable for the person I'm speaking to, how do you make that decision based off of an initial application of who's going to move on to the next round? Um, yeah. Without, yeah, without <laughs> the, without looking at more traditional things. Um, my, my intuition is telling me it's, it's in the content of the questions you're asking, but can you speak a little bit more towards how you actually execute that on a different role by role basis? Yeah, we create a rubric for every role. So there's an application and then we're looking at what good looks like, what great looks like and what mediocre looks like for a particular role. We have some certain standards across all of our applications around up, up, around communication uh, and around expectations around what the like length of uh, you know an answer is. If if we're asking you to answer a question in five or six six sentences and you're going on and on and on and on, even if you have great experience for the role, if you can't follow directions, <laughs> that's like an automatic. That's an that's a that's tough for us. So we have a rubric for each question. Um, and then, you know, there is always a like, we're not necessarily expecting people to answer perfectly every single question, but is there enough basis here to, to say, okay, they have the, right, the communication skills, they have, you know, like 80% of the experience that we're looking for. Is this, does, is this candidate um, like, you know, uh, strong enough to, to spend another 30 minutes with to dive more into that experience. And then when we get on a call, we often do, we don't look at a resume, but we do often go into much more into their work history and their background to get to really flesh out those details. So the application is a good starting point of like, do they have the baseline skills that, we, that they would need to do the role? Awesome, thanks for sharing. And so um, this is a, a question for both of you, but talking through the application and there's things that both companies and the candidates need to be aware of and, and sort of come to this mutual understanding that the companies are going to ask for a lot of things because they're hoping that that 
exists. It's, it's, a, it's a wish list, essentially, not a must have list. I think that's something that should just be very common knowledge, hopefully at this point for a lot of people recruiting, um, especially as, as we dive in and now you have different cultures um, coming in and looking at, oh, should I apply for this role? And already I know there, there's data about men will more likely apply for a role even if they're not meeting all the criteria and women will apply less. Well, what does that look like? Not even just on gender, but from different countries, developing countries versus developed countries. What is, what is that breakdown? And so companies really starting to, to think about that more holistically and ask really for, can you prove the skill sets needed to do the job? Candidates getting an opportunity to see that based off of the questions that you're asking what are the other steps involved, um, Regina, that either you would um, advise companies on doing to, to really get to that next level? As Erica mentioned, like, do we want to learn more about them in a 30 minute call? Then you learn about them. The answer is yes, we want to still learn about them. What are some other ways of navigating people through the process or out of the process that you would recommend? And thank you so much for asking. And, and I, I'd say what Erica's company is doing, like it's, it's something that is not so um, common and it's really great because if, if the candidates are aware, okay, this is the process that we need to follow. I think that level of transparency is something that would be really, really appreciated uh, because the interview process can be really daunting. If you know, okay, what are the steps overall, this, this kind of openness, I've seen some companies, uh, particularly in the remote space, are describing step by step how things look like. That's amazing. And, and it reduces the level of stress for the candidates as well. But if I think about um, the, the challenge is actually an opportunity for the remote companies. The fact that you don't have the real social interaction, like I gave the example earlier with Airbnb and the office space, you are actually, as a remote employer, you are prompt to be much more innovative. And there are so many very, very unique tools right now uh, on the market that are related to either creating a, a very strong message, employer branding message like flip base. So everything is when it comes to um, uh, communication with the candidates, interaction, everything is, is through videos. Videos that showcase the current manager talking about the role, the recruiter talking about the role, you record yourself and then you have a video interaction. So these are the kind of tools that I believe you need to embrace as an employer, but you need to be very mindful of, of adopting technology that empowers you and your teams. And it's not just automating stuff because there is so much talk about AI and machine learning in recruitment. And the last thing we want is to eliminate the human engagement, particularly in a remote setup, you do have already this obstacle in front of you. Um, I've been working with a pretty, pretty cool remote uh, rec tech startup um, that has created a peer to peer video interview platform where candidates interview candidates. I've never heard of that before. And, and again, similar for, this, for the same role. So like they're yeah. competitors almost. Exactly. So let's say you have 100 people applying for a customer support or customer success expert. You spin them through this kind of short video interactions where they interview each other. They flip roles. So one is the interviewer, the other one is the interviewee. Then you change. And then not only that you get feedback uh, from the process, even if you're rejected, but also the hiring team receives information about the level of interaction. Because as Erica mentioned, Communication is one thing that you need to absolutely nail in a remote setup, written, verbal, nonverbal, all three. Um, so yeah, my, my biggest advice is explore the tools that can make your life easier, can make your process lighter and more interesting for both sides. That's fascinating. I think that we could spend like a whole hour digging into like the pros and cons of the competitive interview approach or this peer interview approach. Uh, I love the takeaway around though, like be creative, think outside the box and find ways to really make the process work for the goals of the company and have the tools support the process after that's determined. Don't let the tools define the process. So I think that's a great takeaway for companies scrambling to figure out exactly just like 
how do like how do I technically make this um, this process work? There's lots of interesting things out there, but there's also tools that can meet you exactly where you're at right now, like Zoom, like Skype, etc. Um, we have a question coming in from the audience, going back to you, Erica, to um, really just hone in. We we kind of cut off uh, at the beginning stages of Zapier's interview process and. It would be great if you could describe what the steps are that are involved for candidates throughout your specific process. Yeah, so we have a general framework through the process and then there are a few things that kind of change along the way depending on the level of the role, the type of role, is it a design role, do they need a portfolio review, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's application, uh, a recruiter conversation, usually 30 minutes so we dive in a lot more into background experience all of that and then recruiter we try to get the opportunity to share as much as we can about Zapier and the culture and the role itself um, from there we do what we call a job fit interview and that tends to be 45 minutes to an hour with the hiring manager um, they'll dive in a lot more into the specifics about the role about the team about the challenges that they're having today and then asking a lot more questions of the candidate to really suss out the do they have those skills um, from there, in most roles, um, we do a take home exercise. Um, it is, we give the candidates a week, we give them longer, hey, you had a life before you started interviewing at, at Zapier. <laughs> like if you need more than seven days to complete it, that's fine. Um, we have worked on uh, time boxing all of, all of our take homes so that they're not more than a couple hours for any individual exercise. Um, that was kind of a iteration because some projects even if we'd say oh do two hours we'd get candidates coming back with what was very clearly 30 hours worth of work and so we really tried to figure out how do we make sure that we um ask something you know very small in scope and really specific with set and set expectations about what we actually want to get back um in order to help the candidate um do the best that they that they can um so we do um, skills tests and then we do what we call skills interview, which is then meeting the team. So that may be a cross-functional team, that may be the direct team, it depends on the level, it depends on the role. Most of the time you review that work that you did, you re review the exercise, dive into it, ask questions, look at why they made the decisions that they made um, to really kind of get a clearer picture of like how this person works, how, you know, like how they work, how they think, how they approach problems. Um, then from there, um, we do what we call a values interview. Um, it's not a culture fit interview, um, but we do live by our values at Zapier. Um, it is the only way in which we function <laughs> together as a remote team is by kind of operating the shared contract, which is our values. Um, and so the values interview is with people outside of the team and the department that you'd be working on. So it's a different perspective on what it's like to work with, uh, work at, with, at Zapier people, whatever. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it's also Zapier's chance to get different perspectives on what it's like to work with this person. And so all of those questions are um, behavior based questions on, um, on and how they relate to the values that we're that we're looking for. Um, then we do we do a, a reference check via an anonymous and via an anonymous uh, survey tool. Um, so we get feedback from references, but we don't, we're not necessarily um, looking for specific references. Um, the candidate can share the references that they want, and then we don't actually know who's saying what. So it's just a general, another angle for what it, uh, you know, um, perspectives on this particular candidate. And then we see if there's any patterns in that, in that skill survey that came up in the, in the interviews and to figure out, okay, are these things that came up Let's make sure, are they coachable? Are they things that, 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 that we are, um, are not deal breakers for us? And can move forward to an offer from there. So sounds like a long process. Uh, it's about the same amount of steps as if you're working in an office. Um, they're just remote. <laughs> yeah, that is actually great because that um, brings me to another question that came up, which is with all of these steps and also coordinating schedules that aren't necessarily a traditional nine to five in a certain time zone, uh, especially as hiring becomes way more distributed around the whole world. Do either of you have a perspective on if candidates are spending more or less time interviewing remotely than they would in person? And like, what are your thoughts on maybe 
again, going back to expectations, creating the right expectations around what that timeline looks like. I can kick off um, if, if you like, Erica. Um, now I'm thinking about when I interviewed at Airbnb, I was based in Singapore for a row in Ireland. So I always had to interview after 9 p.m. anyway for an office-based role, right? It wasn't even remote. But I think if we have to take into consideration the current climate, um, corona times, and this is probably going to stay. It's not going to change overnight. Um, my personal experience and what I've heard um, from my lecturing, because I, I do spend a lot of time with job seekers, is that they do employ, uh, they do spend a lot more hours. And it's, it's not traditional hours. Let's say if you're working, you want to you know, look for opportunities after work and then you apply and you try to find gaps uh, during your day. I've seen people getting up at 7 a.m. for interviews and I've seen again 9 or, or 10 p.m. because they're interviewing with people who are based, let's say, on, on the West Coast or people that are based in Asia. So I'd say definitely there is a, a high increase. And the thing is that it's across all different roles. So let's say if technical talent was really scarce in 2019 and it was incredibly difficult to find engineers, now engineers are also let go. So they are also on the market. And same with HR and recruitment, unfortunately. A lot of people, um, a lot of the big companies have announced that they are letting people go. So these people are on the market as well as the normal job seekers, if I can use that term. Mm -hmm. And what do you think companies can do to set expectations or ease concerns or navigate those like 7 a.m. interviews? What does that mean in this whole landscape of remote work where potentially interviews might mirror meeting times? And what does that say about the company themselves that you're applying to work at? I think you need to be very much aware of when these people are available. However, if, if they have jumped into the remote ship, that's why I said it's not for everyone because you really need to stretch your hours and you need to find your productivity hours as well. One thing that it actually happened to me because I'm helping with the hiring for, for this remote startup is I start every single time the interview with saying, hey, if your uh, dog, cat, kids, wife, husband, partner are jumping around you. If you have to eat or drink because it's breakfast time, please don't worry because we're living in a crazy world already. So I think this kind of down to earth approach and being as flexible as it's possible. Um, I think this, this can really be a very, very friendly and very welcoming approach from, from employers to embrace for candidates. Yeah, so, really and humanizing I, the experience. Sorry, I just did jump, jump in. Jump right in. Just because we have, so we give uh, candidates open availability. If somebody wants to interview at seven o'clock at night because it's after their workday and they don't have to take off, great, cool. We can find somebody on the East, like on the West Coast to interview somebody on the East Coast. We have a lot more flexibility to work with our candidates. So it can be really helpful to get um, to move the process faster because we have a little bit more flexibility there. That's not always the case. Um, sometimes we have interviewing teams that are only in one time zone and they do have to be a little bit flexible, but then we also want to make sure that we're setting expectations at the very beginning of saying like, Hey, we're an asynchronous company, but this team is in this time zone most of the time. So you will have to have at least a few hours over overlap with this team for team meetings, for one-on-ones, for whatever cross-functional meetings there might be. Um, and so we, we try to be really clear about, about that. Um, and on Zapier, we've started, there are certain jobs that now are only available in certain time zones. Um, it's just, as we grow, we're over 400 people today. Um, no, just, we will be over 400 people at the end of this year. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's certain things that we know that are working and we want to make sure we're being fair to the candidate. Um, you know, if, like, you know, great, you're awesome, you're the perfect per person for this role, but you're gonna have to work from 11 o'clock at night until seven o'clock in the morning, like, that's rough. <laughs> so so we're, we're really trying to just get as much information from our hiring teams and from our candidates to make sure that like this relationship could really work. And that interview process, I think, is a good um, opportunity to flesh some of that out. 
Yeah, and I'd love to dive into a little bit more specifics around the, the interview process that you described. I think first and foremost, I love the comment about the whole journey being in analysis of if a relationship will work. And so sharing data up front around this is where the rest of the people you'll be collaborating with are located. These are our expectations around asynchronicity versus in, per, in real time meetings. Uh, is this really going to fit into your goals and your desires for what your work life looks like and, and being transparent on both sides, the candidate is interviewing the company, the company's interviewing the candidate so that looking at it as a relationship, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, throughout the, the interview process that you described, Erica, and also Redina, like just the interview process that's quite common, the one theme that still exists, regardless of how creative companies are getting with their holistic process, is at some point there will be an interview. Um, and likely nowadays a video interview. And so a question that I have is what makes remote interviewing using video or audio different than in-person interviewing? I don't know if you want to start? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so honestly, I think a lot of it um, has to do with the amount of signal you get. When you're face to face with somebody in a room, there's a lot, you, you, you get like only a third of your body. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of um, like signal that just gets lost in this particular format. Um, and so I have seen candidates, I've seen scorecards come in after interviews where um, the, the candidate just didn't have energy. It's like, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so does it mean that they, you know, didn't necessarily like, maybe this is not the best format for them. And so a lot of the work that we do with hiring managers is saying, okay, so what's needed for the role? <laughs> I'm timing back in and making sure that, um, that our hiring managers are assessing not necessarily what they see, um, but really what they, the content and the substance of, of the interview. Um, that's a, that's a difference. I think maybe that's not such a difference in in-person interviewing, but I think I've seen it pop up a lot more in my time working at Zapier than I have in, in other environments. Um, that's the, that's the biggest one that I see. Um, I think at Zapier, it's so funny because we live in zoom, like that is the way we communicate, but I don't think of it as being any different, like. I'm going to the office. I'm here on Zoom. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a, a little bit more of a candidate mentality of showing up in a different in a different way. Um, and I think this can make um, can can make candidates nervous. Um, and saying like, oh, I have to be a certain way. I have to show up in a certain way. Um, and um, and so kind of to Regina's point, I'm just like being able to be like, hey, it's cool. The baby's crying in the back. It's all right. <laughs> no worries. We're here. We're here for this this point in time. We'll chat. Um, and, and try to, to just make the, the candidate be as comfortable as possible. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point that Erica brought. I think uh, being able to train the managers, because when you see only um, a section of your body, as, as Erica mentioned already, you judge very quickly based on what you see your perception your main sense is your eyes and sometimes you can't switch to doing something else which is actually listening to what the important pieces are um, and being value driven and skill driven in your approach you really need to have that if a lot of the companies are choosing to have like a proper scorecard where they're all the must-haves and the nice to haves and this is great because it's your map and you need to really follow that map regardless of what you see because Ultimately, we are all biased, right? We can't eliminate that. It's, it's a human nature, but raising that self-awareness and from both sides, yes, there are certain expectations, but you are interviewing through um, 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 a platform, right? You're not face-to-face. -face. You're not directly in front of this human. Um, so whether you wish or not, but you really need to showcase who you are as a person and as a professional. And that starts with the, the communication style. Um, and it's not the case that we're going to divide people into introverts or extroverts. And some people are much better when it comes to public speaking, others are not. But if you have decided to jump in the remote ship, 
there are certain elements that you need to be really fully aware of. Erica mentioned the, the, the overlap in terms of the time zones. That's one thing. Another thing is that, hey, most likely you spent a lot of time on Slack or Zoom or Teams or Hangouts, whatever. It's, yeah, it's Google Meet now. But you kind of have to practice that in advance. That's why I'm, I'm saying to all my, my uh, candidates, um, to the people that I work with, uh, you need to practice. You need to really polish the way you present yourself. It's not about how you're dressed up or the background. I don't think that's the most important. I think it's how you portray yourself because the minute the Wi-Fi drops, okay, and you freeze on the screen, it's either you're going to panic or you're going to start laughing, right? Which one is the better? Definitely humor. Um, and the problem is that these things happen and it might impact you as a manager to say, oh, the internet connection was horrible. That wasn't a good candidate. It has happened to me. And God forbid it happens to someone else, but it's not fair, right? So we need to be mindful of all these tricky things to handle. Yeah, and I think what's interesting there, I think back to one of my very first like teenage year jobs and the, the advice I got was practice your interview in front of a mirror so that you can see yourself like, are you telling a story and frowning? Are you being animated and sharing your story? Are you presenting yourself with confidence? And it's so silly to think about that, but I think about practice how you're going to show up um, from a candidate perspective. So if you've never used Zoom before, get comfortable with where it is because as little things as where you're placing the, the frames of, I call them the Brady Bunch frames, but where you place them on the screen might be the difference between you seemingly having eye contact with the interviewer or not. And all of these little tricks and tips that I'm humbled by as, as someone who's been working remotely for so long um, are good reminders on the interviewer side that not everybody knows these things. Not all of this stuff comes naturally to people, but it doesn't mean that they don't have it in them for it to become natural, just like it's become natural to, to you, Regina, you, Erica, me. Um, there are things that we picked up because we have been working remotely. And I think just reminding hiring managers of that will really open their eyes to focusing on the critical skills um, and not some of the, the things. And, you know, four and a half plus years in, my Wi-Fi still drops from time to time. Um, and, and that's just a sign of, you know, life happens. But think, thinking through just bringing that awareness to hiring managers, another question I have from, from the audience is, is there one very tactical tip? that you would offer to hiring managers when they enter the interview in order to get the most out of the time they're spending with candidates? So we have a, a couple of things that we're, we're actually uh, really focused on trying to, uh, uh, Regina mentioned everyone has bias, so on mitigating bias. Um, and so we ask our hiring managers to um, join the interview right at the start time so that there's not necessarily this kind of bizarre, awkward, because most of our interview, our candidates join on, on Zoom calls a couple minutes early. They want to be prepped, which is great. I'm happy. I want them to, to be ready <laughs> to go. Mm -hmm. um, but when our hiring managers also jump in early, there tends to be this kind of like awkward, nervous, like no, neither of them know what to do. And it can... Um, set off just a bad experience for, for both sides. Um, and so we ask for hand, like super simple, just sign in right on time. Um, <laughs> and so um, that helps to kind of mitigate some of the kind of uh, issues that, that come up um, and just make both parties a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, I think to that point too, unique uh, Zoom rooms for each different candidate is something that can ease awkwardness for hiring managers. So I think hiring managers, a mistake I've seen in the past is using their personal Zoom general link sent out to multiple candidates. And now Zoom has things like the waiting room, which helps a little bit, but there's definitely been cases where two candidates pop in because one candidate is getting to that interview early and the other one hasn't ended yet. Separate it, make sure every candidate has a different room to go to 
as the hiring manager so that you don't throw people off as you're wrapping up the interview or throw someone off before they even have had a chance to present themselves. So I think even all these small little details do matter if this is something you're doing for the very first time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think the only piece that I would add is um, you mentioned it and I couldn't have summarized it better, Ali, that you need to be mindful that not everyone is doing that every single day, right? So we're all different. And particularly when you deal with so many different cultures, people would come across as probably a bit more reserved, um, probably overly chatty, right? These are not labels that we should put on them right away because probably that's the way they cope with stress. Um, one thing that I've advised a lot of the managers, particularly right now, is setting up the scene and really spending even a bit more time in the beginning and in the end uh, in this ice-breaking stage, um, making you relatable. Um, even sometimes what happened to me, I was actually commenting on a candidate's background because it looked like there are a lot of like roller coasters. And I said, oh, I actually worked in a adventure park back in the day in the States. And he was like, oh yeah, me too. So I understand that people do consider that traditionally as biased conversation. But I really think that humans have to be first, especially right now. Um, and I don't think if you are properly trained as a hiring manager, as a recruiter, as a decision maker, you would allow that not to influence how you look at the skills and the experience of this person. But alleviating the, the tension, the, the pressure of having an interview, this might really open up the candidate and you might see miracles by the end of the 30 minutes. Yeah, and I, I like that in terms of setting the stage to make them at ease, also setting the stage with how the interview is gonna flow um, it might help someone really be prepared for what questions are coming the way or how just the, the interaction is going to go on Zoom. Like, is it going to be a conversation we should both be off mute or am I going to ask you a question and there'll be a clear time to respond because even, you know, even today, um, as we get excited and we want to share things, it's easy to be slow to take yourself off mute or talk over someone. And that could be something that additionally adds a layer of stress to a candidate. Um, and so I think all of these just like minor interactions, minor expectation setting really builds up to a bigger picture of a smooth interview. And better review some glass door. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we're starting to near the end of our time. I want to take a look and see if there's any other questions from the audience. So just a, a call for last questions either in the chat box or you can send them directly my way using the Q&A functionality. Um, as we wait for those to trickle in, uh, I would love for each of you to share. Is there you know, this is, this is a great question as well. Is there a question you wish I asked you today that you are dying to share as it comes to better practices for remote interviewing, just to sum up everything that we've learned today? Yeah, that's a good one. I'm always puzzled by this one, always. <laughs> always. The classic stumper at the end, I love yeah. doing that. Um, I think we, we don't have any more questions coming in. I think I stumped you because we just talked about so many amazing things from setting expectations to bringing the human element back into interviewing and not hiding behind all of the tools we need to rely on to make remote interview processes work, to focus on the skills and the teachable moments. And last but not least, um, to think through what are all of the creative ways that you can test for what really is going to be the day-to-day -day life of a candidate from offering asynchronous options to start the process, bringing in variety to the interview process. So both that asynchronous project-focused work versus interviews, opportunities to give feedback along the way and doing anything you can to just help your candidates be at ease during these crazy times will all get you moving forward to being able to hire remote. And once you do hire, remember that there are lots of companies out there that are able to help your remote process flow more. So from Zapier to make those things go automatic, 
and the amazing Oyster that will really help you take that new hire and get them set up with everything they need from benefits to payroll to make sure that they don't have to think about that and can just focus on doing the great work to Redina and Vox Advisory to consult with the, the candidates that you want coming in the door. It's this great ecosystem and we're just getting started. So really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their mornings, afternoons, nights to come and chat more about the future of remote hiring. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. 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 This is great. Bye.